hi everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with you and share more about my experience moving my research online. And I'm wondering just first, um, out of curiosity, how many people here have shifted from in-person to running exclusively online research outside platforms like MTurk and Prolific? Do you just wanna maybe raise your hand? Okay, so a few people. Um, and who is doing this with uh, predominantly children? Out of curiosity, children or adolescents? So slightly fewer people, okay. Great, that's just helpful to know. Um, I will be talking about my experience um, with uh, both child and adult research, but in general, I'll be focusing on um, my experience working with kids and families online. All right, so let's jump in. Okay, on March 10th, 2020, I received this email from our Center for Decision Research Faculty Director, Nick Epley, informing us that all in-person lab operations were to cease immediately. And at the time this email was sent, there were research assistants at Union Station in downtown Chicago collecting data for one of my studies. So they literally had to pack up and, and come home to Hyde Park. And uh, here you can actually see what our setup looked like at Union Station. I'm sure many of you have been there. So soon thereafter, our amazing CDR staff went into overdrive to identify new processes we could put in place to continue our work remotely. And I actually asked one of our lab managers um, to join today. Should they or should you have any questions about our specific processes that um, I'm unable to answer? And I do promise that this presentation isn't just a love note to the CDR staff, but their efforts should be commended and we can learn from the processes they put in place to facilitate streamlined data collection operations and ensure good data quality. All right, so it was hard for me to decide where to start this talk, but ahead of putting these slides together, I used this opportunity to reflect on my last year conducting studies exclusively online with both children and adults. And so to give you some insight into my life after Michigan, prior to the pandemic, you could find my team and me at the Museum of Science and Industry almost every weekend. And on your left, you'll see Yen Yi and Michael prep to run a study examining prosociality in childhood. And sometimes Henry, who you see up here, would walk me to and from my ships, since I'm right here in Hyde Park. But now you can find Henry at my feet. He is at my feet right now, um, as I work with children from around the world, though mostly in the US, or assistants like Rimsha working with participants from their own homes. So um, if you're on Twitter, you know, this is sort of a meme, but how did I get from how it started to how it's going? And, and I, I hope to answer some of that today. And so for the next 25 minutes, I'm going to do my best to identify some key considerations you should make as you work through your own online research processes. And as a part of this, I'll share what I do. I'll also point to some specific resources I found helpful, both in thinking about the logistics of online research, but also the implications of moving research online. I'll then end with what I see as some opportunities to leverage the connections we make through online research programs to further science. And so to be clear, I know that my list of considerations and resources is not exhaustive, but I am trying to offer a starting point for those who have only dabbled in online research and want to systematize their processes. And to be clear, again, I'm really not touching on considerations and issues around running studies on survey platforms like MTurk and Prolific. All right, so let's start with key considerations. When organizing my thoughts, three categories emerged, though the considerations for each are not mutually exclusive. The three categories include considerations to make as a lab uh, when recruiting and working with participants and for individual studies. I'm gonna highlight a few items within each category that I think are especially important. When it comes to lab considerations, I'm going to talk about communication and connectedness. When it comes to participant, considerations, I'm going to highlight recruitment and compensation issues. And when it comes to individual study uh, considerations, I'm going to talk about timing and methods. 
So right now, many labs are working completely remotely. And this means that team members are spread around the world. And this won't always be the case, at least I hope not. So there are considerations to make now, given the current university environment, and then perhaps different considerations to make for the future when we're back to working together in person. I'm going to focus on the considerations to make now, given that we may be slow to transition to in-person work this fall, if we're back together on campus this fall at all. So here are two questions I think a lot about. How are we going to communicate and document our communication? And how can I facilitate feelings of connectedness among team members? So when deciding how you want to organize your team, you'll need to consider where you want your communication to live. And I quickly learned email is messy. There are dozens of productivity and project management tools out there to help you organize your projects in groups. I'm partial to Slack, mostly because that's what I have experience working with and it works for me. And our center uses Slack to facilitate communication among RAs and other staff members. I've also come to learn that people have strong project management preferences. So I recommend reaching out to see what your students and colleagues are using. Obviously, Mbox and university servers are great places to store things permanently. But these project management tools are also helpful toward disseminating files quickly and efficiently to large groups and managing hiccups and quick fixes as needed. And so here is what Slack looks like if you aren't familiar. I'm not showing our CDR Slack here, but I am showing what Slack can look like using uh, the writing community that um, I co-organized with some other folks. So you can have different channels that will address different project needs or personnel needs. Um, and then you of course can integrate uh, some different apps that will help you uh, manage projects and productivity. And then of course, within each channel, there are opportunities to um, engage in discussions that um, can be threaded or not. Another example of what um, a project management can, tool can look like is uh, Basecamp. These are screenshots shared by Verona Gonzalez, who's a PhD student in psychology at UMed Amherst. And what I like about this is um, that you can actually see where projects are within um, a camp, but you can also organize a lot of projects uh, within one headquarters. And so again, I just, you know, if you haven't already, um, I recommend investing seriously um, in, in some of these project management tools that can help you coordinate, even across just PIs and graduate students, to help you all keep track of where everyone is, what they're doing, and, and to also facilitate feelings of connectedness to the lab and among lab members. And on the topic of communication, it's also important to understand the needs of your research team members. To engage in inclusive science, we need to reduce barriers to participation. So for team members working remotely, it's important to identify what is needed to continue research activities. For example, will internet speed be an issue? For students living far away from campus, and here you can see where some of my research assistants are located, what can be done to make sure they can still be involved in projects, even if unable to collect data? And so I recommend thinking through the different ways students can be involved in research and solicit feedback from students to determine how you can support team members. And in doing so, we help students feel more connected to the lab and the projects they're working on. And on the topic of connectedness, which is something I, I study uh, tangentially in, in some of my work, I've been super lucky to work with such fantastic RAs and, and I miss seeing them in the lab, even just, bumping into them on campus, unplanned. And, and these are moments I miss and can only do so much to recreate online. But good research starts here with the team. So making sure team members feel supported is important. And if you know me, you know I can live in this section for the whole talk, but let's move on to participants and recruitment. So a lot of what we know about human behavior is based on weird populations and there are concerns that shifting online will yield even less diverse samples. So let's talk about that for a minute. On the one hand, online research can reduce barriers to participating. On the other, it can introduce new barriers to participating. This is why I included no participant left behind 
as suggested reading. In terms of reducing barriers, online research affords participant flexibility. It can be hard to come to a physical lab space during work hours, and regardless of one's schedule, there's travel involved, which usually comes at some cost, even if it's offset by study compensation. So allowing people to complete studies from their own homes removes some serious transportation and time barriers to participation. Further, lab spaces themselves may not feel especially comfortable. So for this reason, allowing people to participate in studies from the comfort of their homes may alleviate some concerns and encourage participation from people who might otherwise not feel comfortable doing so. At the same time, moving research online can introduce new barriers to participation. And one barrier I think a lot about is internet access. So there's a persistent gap in home broadband adoption between white and black and Hispanic adults. With this in mind, it's important to consider what sort of internet access is needed, as well as what type of technology will be required. Will a, excuse me, will a phone be sufficient or will a computer be? be required. And if you had a chance to read Rose et al's paper that I also suggested, you'll see that they didn't experience a decrease in racial diversity of their child samples when moving to unmoderated online research. However, they acknowledged that there might be some economic differences. Given that we make trade-offs with every research decision we make, I'd like for us to talk more about the trade-offs we've made and what we've seen in our own online studies, especially with respect to sample diversity. I'm now going to transition to discussing recruitment and Henry's over this talk. So just... All right. Okay. So as a developmental scientist uh, studying children, recruiting participants can be difficult at times. In this exclusively online environment, recruiting any participant outside platforms like MTurk and Prolific can prove difficult as well. Because I'm reflecting on my own experience, I'm gonna focus more on efforts to recruit children and families right now. So first, my goal is to cast a wide net and reach as many families as possible. And I'm sure I share this goal with everyone here. At the same time, this is quite difficult. So to begin, I post my studies on Children Helping Science, a collaborative effort designed to easily connect parents and researchers. I also use social media like Facebook and Twitter, making my posts public so that others can repost my information easily. This has been especially helpful as friends and colleagues have spread the word and shared my information with parenting groups around the US. At the CDR, we also use Reddit, online job boards, mailing lists, and webinars to advertise our study offerings. I was also able to create a landing page, so thank you, Chris, uh, for parents to visit to learn more about my studies and recruitment efforts. These landing pages dedicated to online studies, especially with children, are super helpful and fairly straightforward to add to existing lab sites. And because I see this as a long-term opportunity to build out a database of online participants, I've included a survey that parents can complete to remain active in our system and hear about new studies for their children. And once studies get going, um, I notice that parents of, of child participants are actually sharing out my information as well without my knowing. And it's actually quite fun to learn that families were having a good time and then felt moved to share out my information to parents um, of their children's classmates. And one more thing I want to mention here is compensation. There are a lot of IRB restrictions around compensation. At the CDR, we compensate via e-gift cards to the US-based Amazon store for our online studies. I'm also running a study in China right now where Amazon won't work. So we're offering credit to an Amazon-like store based in China. And this isn't gonna work for everyone, nor is it what everyone wants. We can also talk about compensation during our discussion in terms of what's working, what we can do better um, and where we can do better. But uh, let's move on. So recruiting is tightly linked with individual studies. So let's turn to those next. So you have a study that you'd like to run online. The next question or one next question is how? Will you run your study synchronously so that study team members will meet one-on-one -on -one or one-on-few with participants and guide them through the study? Or will you run asynchronously using unmoderated methods? 
like what you do when you use mTurk or Prolific. However, here by unmoderated, I mean using your own or another platform to host your studies, such as your lab website or other sites like Panda Lab or Lookit. And unmoderated studies have the added benefit of allowing participants to complete studies at their leisure whenever is most convenient for them. And I'm sure you're all, of course, well acquainted with mTurk and Prolific, but these uh, don't work so well for everyone um, and their data collection needs. Marjorie Rhodes, also a Michigan alum, uh, alum, and colleagues have built out an online survey platform via the Panda Lab to support both moderated and unmoderated or synchronous and asynchronous studies. Lots of great information is available via their discoveries online site, which is also discussed in the suggested reading I shared written by her and her team. And in that paper, you'll see that they replicate some key findings related to children's essentialist beliefs using these unmoderated tasks. There's also the look at lab, which is down here. This is housed at MIT, and this also supports unmoderated research with children as well. And lastly, we even run moderated and unmoderated studies for non-U Chicago researchers via the CDR virtual lab. So depending on the type of study you're running, including how much guidance is needed by experimenters, unmoderated might be the way to go. And we can talk more about the trade-offs we make when shifting from synchronous to asynchronous research during our discussion period. And one thing that will determine whether you can run a study asynchronously is whether you're recruiting individuals or multiple participants at a time. I've become quite accustomed to running pair and group studies, which is an added benefit of working with adults. This is much easier to do with them. But it's also an added benefit of moving research online. I've run pair studies in person, but it would usually involve working with each person within a pair sequentially, though not always. And regardless of how you decide to proceed, you're going to wanna to make sure that your participants are able to complete your online studies. So if building out a database for online studies, which I highly recommend you consider investing in, um, I'm going to show you what a process for that could look like on the next slide. So thank you first to Sarah Jensen for putting this together, for uh, putting together this information for how we do this at the CDR. So here, this slide does not pertain to the child uh, research, I will say this pertains to studies exclusively with adults. So depending on how participants are going to engage with research, their technology requirements will differ. This process was implemented to ensure that participants have access to reliable internet, the appropriate technologies, and were proficient in using computers, including Zoom. So in some cases, they meet directly with RAs to make sure that everything is working on their end. So you'll see, just like at Michigan, participants can sign up for studies via SONA. Um, we email, that's how we communicate with our participants is through SONA, our adult participants. And then prior to engaging in um, any study, they'll complete a computer skills survey, um, which that just is like a Qualtrics link survey. Um, and if they want to participate in our Zoom studies, which require video, we will also have them complete a Zoom prerequis prerequisite study. And I can actually share out a link at some point if you would like to see what that looks like to make sure that they understand how Zoom works and how it should be set up on their end during our Zoom-based tasks. And also I think it's important to see what this process can look like with a little added infrastructure. So, um, the reason I share this is because I think perhaps there's an opportunity for shared infrastructure like this in psychology at Michigan. Um, and based on my own experience at Michigan and now at uh, Chicago, we could talk more about what that could look like. But essentially, we can recreate lab spaces using Zoom or another online um, video platform, though I'm, I'm only proficient in Zoom right now. <laughs> Uh, where you have, you know, a waiting room as you would in a physical lab space, you have a lobby, and then you can divert participants to specific rooms that are associated with RAs who are helping out with um, individual studies on, on any particular day. Now, the last thing I'll say about individual studies is that we don't know the limits of what can and cannot be done, but we arguably don't know this for in-person studies as well. But as we think about replicability, reproducibility, and generalizability, 
which I'll touch on in a few minutes, it will be important to think, think through what failures to replicate mean. And I put failures to replicate quotations in my head, I did that. Um, and I'd like for us to talk more about this as well. So in a recently posted preprint, Smith, Flores and colleagues tested the degree to which findings observed during, a, uh, during violation of expectation studies replicated when being tested with infants online. And you'll see in this one figure alone um, that infants has been, has, as has been previously observed um, in in-person tasks look longer at surprising events during uh, the support task, but then this classic result was not obtained in the solidity task. So we need to think through how we're going to interpret these results and how we'll frame differences across study modalities. And to close out this portion of the talk, I'm going to highlight some resources I found helpful when thinking about online research, especially with children. So the papers shared here include those that I've already highlighted. And I can pause here for a moment so you can review the list, but know that this list is in no way exhaustive and I can certainly share the list out separately if you would like, but I would um, papers focusing on developmental research. There's also this paper here, The Pandemic as a Portal, which does include Neil uh, Lewis Jr., who's also a Michigan alum, um, thinking about how we can um, use what is going on right now to um, make psychology as a science more open and inclusive. And then other wonderful resources include webinars that have been freely offered, such as this one by the Social Learning and Child Labs at Stanford and Harvard. This is a great resource for anyone, not just those working with children. Academic Twitter is also a great resource. Um, Pam is very active and, and sharing out wonderful papers and whatnot, and I'm sure others here are on Twitter as well. And also parents offer fantastic feedback. So, so the point here is to always be open to feedback, but what's wonderful about parents is that they're on the other side of the interaction, watching their children participate, and they're able to offer wonderful anecdotes and insights into their child's behavior. So actually do build in time to ask parents, even adults who are just participating themselves, to share how they saw the interaction and whether there's anything we can do as researchers to make the experience better for families. And also children share their opinions as well. That's a wonderful thing about children. So uh, what I particularly enjoy is when they spontaneously share that they've had a fun time and they want to talk again. Um, and so again, just really lean on the families, you know, who are willing to offer feedback as well as the research assistants who are out there working with participants every day. So now I'd like to think a bit bigger about what online research could mean for developmental psychology and psychology more broadly. So many of us shifted our research online out of necessity. At the same time, several researchers have been thinking through how we can leverage this increase in online research for the good of developmental science. There are already several notable collaborative efforts in developmental psychology, such as CHILD, so this is the Child Language Data Exchange System, the Databrary Project, which makes videos accessible, and the Many Babies Consortium which is a collaborative project for replication and best practices in developmental psychology research. Um, and I've already touched on some of the online platforms that have emerged in my previous uh, slides. However, these researchers are calling for an even larger scale coordination, which mirrors other such collaborative efforts in other sciences, such as the Hubble telescope. And the advantages of this shared infrastructure for recruitment, experiment, implementation, data collection, et cetera, include increases in sample size and sample diversity. Um, it can also help decouple family and researcher location, and this can help researchers in less densely populated areas and allows for a wider reach for an individual um, lab's set of studies. And actually parents might be more interested in participating um, in a series of studies, given the wider range of studies available through such a collaborative effort. In addition, researchers can align on shared design principles and participant experiences. So here we have an opportunity to work with people to standardize our methods across different, um, across different labs. 
And what I like about this as well is we can separate study design from administration, which can help increase reproducibility. And so by asking trained RAs to run studies for multiple labs, we are uh, reducing the, the um, perhaps the incidence of cases where we lack uh, replicable findings or finding replicated findings due to perhaps nuances that were associated with the way that a study was administered by a particular person within a particular lab. And lastly, uh, these larger scale efforts can help facilitate longitudinal data collection. We're often logistically limited to conducting cross-sectional studies. However, some of our questions might be better answered using longitudinal methods. And larger scale collaboratives may offer one way to reducing barriers uh, to participating in this kind of science. So there's this question about data being noisier. Um, so uh, at home rather than in the lab. So some uh, in the paper shared by uh, from Rhodes and colleagues, they obtained similar results across the unmoderated sessions, which you could imagine would introduce the most noise. Um, at, um, in, would introduce the most noise. English is hard some days. Um, so, so what I'm trying to say is they observed similar results across unmoderated and moderated studies, in-person studies, um, and. Um, so I would say that in some ways you might expect the data to be noisier and perhaps this would influence, you know, if you think you have a particularly weak effect that you're uh, studying, that you might need to increase your sample size in order to have adequate power to detect that effect. But in my own experience, um, as someone who has predominantly run their research in museum settings, it's no more noisier in the home than, than in these museum settings or these public spaces. But if someone else here has experience collecting data sort of in a, in a physical lab space and has been able to compare that to results that they've obtained running studies online, I certainly welcome that person to share their experience. Okay. Lastly, um, as a former coordinator of Michigan's Living Lab, I'm a huge proponent of public science. And it's always been important to me to make sure that my research team reflects the population of children I'm working with. So ensuring children can see themselves and the researchers they work with is powerful. So through my own online efforts, I've had many wonderful conversations with children and their families and see online research as a way to engage in science outreach. And there are initiatives such as Skype a Scientist that already connect classrooms and families with scientists. And as a side note, if you have not signed up as a scientist for this program, I highly recommend it. I've gotten to chat with several classrooms in the US and Canada, but we can also use our online research as a way to share out our findings with those affected by our research most. So in this way, I encourage researchers to learn more about science communication. If you haven't already and identify ways you can help nurture children's and adults' curiosities. And one natural time to do this is during the debriefing process and or via newsletters summarizing your lab's findings for the participants who contributed to your different studies. And so that's what I have for you in terms of considerations to make, helpful resources to make use of, and opportunities to leverage online research for the good of the field. You can also read more about my experience with research online via this piece I recently published on Medium, and, and here's one quote from a parent that I, I really like. So, um, you know, I study financial decision making, and so uh, this parent was talking about compensation and said, um, you know, this type of arrangement, so this online research and then us sending e-gift cards to the Amazon store offers a kind of early introduction to working for things you want, because with, and, and also, with most online studies, you have an appointment and you're actually talking to a person. So it feels like an event which helps break up the day. So for a lot of our kids who are at home all day or even still doing school all day, having these sorts of opportunities to engage with people outside the home um, serves to help um, orient themselves to the day and just like have a good experience with, with um, 
you know, people who they otherwise wouldn't get to talk to. So uh, I can certainly share more about what I wrote and, and enjoy hearing more about your experiences with online research, but my 30 minutes is up. So let's transition to discussion time. Um, and this is a choose your own adventure type of discussion. So I've identified four questions that might interest the group and we can start and stop wherever you would like. Um, I wish I could see more of you right now. I mean, by that, I mean, I can only see if I would like to see who all is here, but um, we have the question, the questions I have here are what are important trade-offs we make when moving between in-person and online research? Um, what could shared infrastructure for online research at Michigan look like? This is one I really wanna talk about because I think there's an opportunity here to um, engage, you know, have, have a more um, collaborative effort across labs to, um, you know, have some of these larger scale efforts in-house. Also, it'd be great to talk about barriers to creating and are participating in these large scale collaborative efforts and how we can adequately test the limits of what we can and cannot do via online research. So where shall we start or, or not? And free space means this is, you get to choose the question. Well, I'll just start by saying thank you, Margaret. And there were some echoes in the chat. Um, everyone was just really grateful for um, leading this discussion and, and the resources that you've compiled and things to, to get people started and thinking. It certainly seems like this is a field where, or this is an area where it, it's not gonna be a one size fits all. It depends on the lab and the individual studies and can we do a large scale collaborative effort? So there's a lot of digging that needs to be done. So just having these resources available to start is, is amazing. So, so I wanna say thank you and, and I, I get similar sentiments from others, um, but I will be quiet now because I see um, Pam has raised her hand. So I'll let Pam but take it away. Quick question. Should oh, I stop sharing my screen so we can see each other? It's it's up to you. Um, I it's think so, you. Margaret. I think it would be easier to. Yeah, agree. Yeah. Thanks, Pam, for making the executive <laughs> decision. <laughs> okay, wait. Going? I'm okay. going to take now the I'm free here. space um, box. Okay. Uh, because it, while you're talking, it just occurred to me that we have, um, so one of the ways we've tried to diversify our samples is to collect them through the schools, but the schools are really difficult uh, to work with, especially the Ann Arbor schools, um, it's almost impossible to get into them, but that's true for lots of other, especially college town related schools, but that this might actually be a way that we could say we're not coming in, they're still we still want to videotape and we still want to get information from the classrooms, but saying all we want you to do is hand out these forms um, because we're going to do it all online. So we're not going to be, what we usually do is pull people from classrooms and test them. And instead we could adapt this. And this, and because part of the, the problem is our burden on the schools from being in the schools. And I, I thought this really opens up some new potential possibilities um, with this, this very complicated relationship we have with schools, because uh, it gets to one of your questions, which, you know, what are some of the issues? And I had this back and forth on Twitter, that if all we're getting is the same, so it's great to get power, so we're getting more people, but if all we're getting is the same education group we're getting, then we're not really diversifying our samples. We're getting the same sample in larger quantity, and, and which is good. There's reasons for that, to, and I'm huge about getting extra power, um, but, it, but a lot of people are saying, oh, look at the diversity of the sample. And I'm like, but you don't know that it's diverse. It's people who are still agreeing to do your study, which is highly selected. Uh, and the beauty of, of the schooling one is, is that we generally can diversify into, into bigger groups of people that don't normally agree to our lab studies. And that's why we've done. So anyway, I just, you know, I thought this just opened up a whole nother door that you hadn't talked about, but that I thought was like an amazing one that might help our schooling research also benefit from going online. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I agree, right? So what we're learning is that there, are, you know, one thing about being a developmental researcher is that you have to be clever um, because in many cases, you can't just ask children the question you wanna ask, you have to go about it a different way. And I think, um, you know, 
the way that we're harnessing these tools for our research uh, is another example of the ways in which we can be clever um, and resourceful when figuring out how we can be better scientists. So I, I think the idea of using this as a way to reduce barriers to entry into schools is, is interesting. And I would have to think more about that because, you know, there's also, you know, I, I have talked with some people who are doing school-based studies and are trying to diversify their samples in ways that reflects the student population among uh, Chicago public schools children. And so we also want to think about, you know, it's great to get in and get consent, but we also want to make sure that parents have the technologies they need in the home in order to participate in the studies. So what some people are doing is actually providing these technologies on an as needed basis so that, it, but that's not realistic for every lab. You know, if I'm a new faculty, I'm not going to purchase a hundred laptops or tablets. I, well, maybe, I mean, sure, it all depends, but but that would be very difficult to do without adequate funding. So it, it's- That's your startup you asked for, Margaret. You can yeah. get that. <laughs> that's okay. the best time to get that. <laughs> Noted, okay. Ask for 100 tablets, got it. Pam told me to. Um, <laughs> Not a bad idea, actually. So, um, but but so there's not only just you know getting into other schools, but also you know making sure on on the user end or the participant end that that there are adequate technologies in the home. Unless you were going to allow kids, for example, to you know one thing that that was mentioned in the no participant behind article was that you know it's great that we have these online, um, the infrastructure for this online research now. A lot of people go to public spaces to use computers um, or other sorts of technologies that they need. And so when we're able to do that safely, that might be one way that we can more easily um, do research through schools in ways that reduces the burden on, on the student's end in terms of having to leave class and the teacher's end in terms of having to build that into their class day. And in terms of the school, making sure that the floodgates don't open when, when one researcher is able to get through. So, so lots to think about, but you know, your comment um, has me thinking about other ways that I can be, be doing this. You know, one thing we did already at the uh, Center for Decision Research, and I know other uh, people have done this um, uh, elsewhere in, in developmental psych, is we actually just go out into the field and we go to the parks in Chicago and we run studies and we have our tablets and our hotspots. So another way that we can, you know, even if someone in the home has, you know, a laptop with, with a webcam, we wanna make sure they have adequate access because, you know, some surveys, excuse me, some studies use surveys, that's not going to be a burden on, on the bandwidth, but if we have lots of videos, that is. So providing hotspots to, to families or participants as well. So, so there's a lot to think about, and I'm glad a lot of people are thinking about it, but it also means I have to think more to know what I think, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Thanks, Margaret. I think Daniel had a, a question next. Oh, uh, well, really interesting talk. Thank you so much for uh, for giving that presentation. Um, I don't. I'm not a developmental researcher, but I feel like I'm always a developing researcher, and so that was really useful to think about. Um, I've made a shift to online data collection um, just for college students this last year, um, and one thing that occurred to me um, is. Uh, that I wonder what, if you have any thoughts about very large scale efforts, kind of similar to things like the ABCD study that is being done where I think the attempt is to link behavior, but also more imaging kinds of effects to subsequent, you know, drug uh, outcome, life outcomes. Um, that study might involve 10,000 people, but I wonder if, for example, a behavioral study that is relatively cheap in comparison to imaging to conduct and that could potentially recruit a hundred thousand, you know, like huge numbers of people on, in an online forum. Is that something like these large scale perspective developmental studies? Could you imagine something with, I don't know, a hundred thousand participants 
um, where maybe that some of it is, it wouldn't all be these RA kind of interactions that you're describing, but maybe they're doing an online task that can be done in like, I don't know, 30 minutes and they're just sitting at home doing something. Is that something that's, that could be useful? I, I, the second question I have is, um, I've just noticed, I think a lot of people, even at Michigan in psychology do behavioral experiments, but all the data are in different labs. Like, so even if I'm running a Stroop task and Adrian's running a Stroop task and five other people are running a Stroop task, it's not like we ever integrate these things together. And I wonder, um, I don't know, just if you have thoughts about like, not just large scale things with a hundred thousand people, but even departments who want to like kind of do different variations of a task and, um, would, would this online kind of transition be helpful for that? So uh, for your first question, I mean, sure. Why wouldn't that be possible? I mean, difficult doesn't mean impossible. Uh, there already are, as you know, um, uh, surveys that are sent out to um, thousands and thousands of adults and, and adolescents that they complete um, already. And so, you know, to do, to continue doing that work with children, I mean, I imagine again, it's possible. I, that's all I can say. Um, I, and I think it would, you know, for the right type of study, it could be illuminating for my work. It would be excessive, uh, to recruit a hundred thousand participants, but, um, you know, I, so yes, possible, yes. And I'm sure people are thinking about this and in some ways they're already doing it through the, um, the surveys that, that are already out there. Uh, and then in terms of, so, so the Character Lab will do large scale studies, they, not 100,000, but the Character Lab, which is um, Angela Duckworth and Katie Milkman at, uh, at, at Penn. Um, they will uh, facilitate data collection on a larger scale with middle school kids, I believe, high school kids. And, and so you can actually uh, go through their lab to reach a broader audience. Um, then to your second question, which was about, could you remind me? Oh, I was just... In a more limited scale, I just noticed, and maybe this is not something oh, right. that important, but yeah. we, all, we all, within a department, people just run, like, would this help people collaborate more? Because we never really combine data across labs. Like if 10 psychology professors are running a Stroop task for completely different purposes, it's all coded up in their individual labs and maybe their students are doing it. But mm -hmm. I can imagine that if there was a collaboration in an online framework, everybody could use the same kind of task or different variations of the same task and it would all be collected in a central place. So therefore maybe easier to analyze. I just wonder if, if that's a, a use of online data collection that you think is valuable or maybe it has limitations that I'm not thinking of. Or... Well, so first Pam has shared a comment in the chat um, talking about you know, harmonizing data across uh, studies, which I think is fantastic. Um, after shifting from the, you know, PI, you know, I was in a lab and it was Susan Gelman's lab and it's a wonderful lab to be in. And then moving to um, a booth where I am now, where there's more shared infrastructure, there are still individual PIs, but we're drawing from similar resources. We're using RA, the same RAs who are trained on lots of tasks. Um, I see a lot of value in that and I really like that model. And it's a similar model, I believe, as used in the behavioral lab at Ross. I think this is more uh, representative of what these lab spaces look like perhaps in other types of schools. But I do think given Michigan psychology size, that this could be a wonderful way to aggregate resources um, because there's also an issue of equity. I mean, even though Michigan is a well-resourced institution, there are differences across faculty in terms of access to resources and um, you know, students working on different projects and, and whatnot. And, and so there is um, an opportunity there to be a bit more efficient, to build out a larger database, to standardize processes, perhaps 
improve data quality and to not reinvent the wheel. So if every lab is running, you know, a series of cognitive tasks that have been completed by the same participants, you know, especially if drawn from subject pool, uh, there's an opportunity there to be a bit more efficient and to focus more squarely on, on the questions that might interest you most. And I'll also find commonalities across, pro across projects, right? So, you know, one thing I miss about just being in person um, are these incidental uh, um, chats that I would have with faculty or, or other researchers in the CDR, like, hey, what are you working on? Um, so one added benefit of having uh, this sort of uh, collaborative effort in-house is that you have people who say, hey, Margaret, did you know Mike was running a study related to yours? Let me tell you about it. Like, that's amazing. Um, and, and, it's, it's, and, and the only reason I have that is because there are people working, um, our, our staff, and our RAs working on lots of projects for lots of PIs um, under the same umbrella, which is the Center for Decision Research. If I could comment on that too, I mean, I, I agree in the efficiency and the large scale studies, there's so much benefit of it. But I think one thing we haven't worked out as a field, like let alone as a, as a department and it inter intersects with this and it intersects with some of the themes we've talked about today with like, open science and resources as well, is what that means, especially for junior people in getting credit for their work and for their effort, right? Can, can you say that I've done this for this study, this has been like my niche and, and um, you know, this is my unique contribution, that it gets lost a little bit in these larger mm -hmm. studies. Now, not that that's not that we shouldn't do them, but it's that we have to change kind of the reward structure and, and how we incentivize, you know, as academics, how we incentivize collaborative large scale research, because these are big projects, right? To collect 100,000 people takes more than any one lab, any one PI mm -hmm. could do, um, but it's something that we probably need to do. But how do we, how do we make sure people's contributions to those large efforts are recognized and not just seen as like, oh, well, they were part of the study, but that wasn't theirs. Um, you know, we yeah, have to no. think that's, we have to think, shift how we think about our science and, and how we incentivize and reward our science. That's, that's something else, at least for me, that's coming out of a lot of this. 100%, you know, I think about this a lot in relation to some of the work I do that is not that, that I think is needed, but is not necessarily um, rewarded uh, in the same way my, my research is. And I, you know, I could, I'm riffing because I am but a postdoc, but um, I imagine you can't control what other universities are doing. We, we can only, you know, work, let's just say Michigan Psych and maybe even within that it's Michigan Developmental Psych or whatever and decide that we're gonna to commit to rewarding these sorts of efforts, which, you know, if you're engaging in long-term long thinking then, that you're creating a more sustainable program of research, a more sustainable science in and of itself. And so, you know, I'm not the decision maker, but I think it would be wonderful for, and, and perhaps this is already being done, but for some department at a place like Michigan to say, we're doing it and here's evidence that we're doing it. Um, we're not just saying it, right? So. Um, yeah, and as Pam noted in the chat, there's other, there's models for this, you know, um, psychology is, is kind of unique in those ways. So, so there's definitely models for this. Um, we have a, a question from Sammy and I think this will probably be our last one. Hey, Sammy, long time no. Yeah, good seeing you, great job. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So I have a sort of a two part question. Um, so, I mean, from a general sense, do you kind of have an idea of the types of assessments that would be more amenable to online adaptation? Um, and so, sort of, have you thought of sort of maybe some of the constructs that developmentalists study um, that maybe wouldn't transfer to an online platform? Um, for various reasons, I mean, like sort of broad, broadly speaking. 
Maybe. I mean, you do know we have one minute, Sammy. Right? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. Maybe we can catch up later, but uh, I'm just interested. No, so that's one of the questions, right? It, it's hard for me to think about methods I don't use on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's been fairly straightforward for me to transition to my research being done online, right? Because I do a lot of pointing and I use a lot of like, you know, circle scales and things like that. So it was a matter of creating interesting uh, pictures and, and importing them into a Qualtrics survey. That is not gonna work for everyone. If you do, I, I do know though, if you go to um, the Discoveries online site, so the site associated with Marjorie Rhodes and her colleagues, they do have um, a, a bit of information about how they've done things like in, included um, timing and whatnot, because that's gonna be relevant for some people, being able to know when you clicked, where you clicked and all that stuff. That is outside my wheelhouse, but um, I know for my purposes, it's been fairly straightforward because also you're talking about someone who has to do stuff in museums. So, but, but if you're doing imaging and things like that, I mean, that is, a, I do know some people are able to do some physiological stuff because they're dropping kits off at homes but that is, that is separate, so. Yeah, and, and sort of a related question to that is, is when you're adapting tasks, um, to what extent do you have to sort of, um, I mean, get permission from the person who's developed the task or, I mean, are there any copyright issues when developing your own online protocol? Um, you mean like if I'm using a standardized assessment? Yeah, like if you're using like the Stroop task, for example, like Daniel Oh, Lindsay. sure. Yeah. I mean, so and can you do you have freedom in adapting those sorts of tasks um, from sort of a I guess a proprietary perspective? That should that information should be on someone's site about how you can use the study. But I think you know this is video, so it can be used against me in court. But uh, <laughs> you know if there are concerns, I would ask the person who has created you know go to stroop.com. I don't know. <laughs> that was so bad. But, but I do know, you know, we're citing these things anyway, right? Like we, we cite this, you know, the original source when we're using standardized assessments. So, uh, you know, I think as long as we're appropriately citing the sources we're using, that's fine. Uh, but if you do go to some sites, they will um, mention how you can and cannot adapt without author consent. I am sorry to not, I mean, you could have generated this response yourself, but um, again, you're talking to the person who uses circle scales <laughs> and happy face scales. So <laughs> thank you, Margaret. I'm an expert at that. But thank you all so much. It's so nice seeing you all again.